Thanks so much, Michael. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our meeting in May and our presenters. I wanted to extend a warm welcome today to Ashley Bodkins and Sherry Frick. And today they'll be presenting to us about choosing the right apples and pears. So by way of introduction, Ashley has been with the University of Maryland Extension in Garrett County since 2008. She started her career with Extension working as a nutrient manager, management advisor, but transitioned to her current role in 2013. Ashley and her husband have two young daughters and reside in West Virginia. They raise Holstein beef steers and live on a farm adjoining their family's dairy farm. They also have two high tunnels, which produce seasonal fruits, vegetables, and cut flowers. And to introduce Sherry today, Sherry has been the agriculture and natural resource educator for the University of Maryland Extension in Allegheny County since 2014. Previously, she acted as the market coordinator for Garrick Growers, a farmers co-op, and acted as an assistant plant breeder and nursery manager for Five Acres Breeding, a strawberry and raspberry breeding company. Ms. Frick has three years of experience performing tissue culture for a variety of plant species, including raspberries, strawberries, hops, tomatoes, and asparagus. Sherry's special interests include incorporating native plants into the landscape and planning community gardens. So again, a very warm welcome from the Montgomery County Master Gardeners to our county peers, and we look forward to your presentation today. Over to you. Thank you so much, Renu. So today's presentation is going to be about choosing apples and pears, and I think a lot of folks don't spend enough time trying to research what it is they need to do in order to be successful in growing apples and pears. Um, they actually can be a little bit more difficult than you might expect. Fruit trees um, get a lot of insect and disease problems. So you need to educate yourself, uh, especially if you don't want to use pesticides about what's, what's out there that you can plant in your garden um, that will be disease resistant. There's only a few things that are insect resistant. So that's something you're always going to have to fight with. But we're going to talk about today how to make those um, inform choices so that you can be more successful at growing apples and pears in your yard. Okay, next slide, please. And we've already been introduced and you all know all about University of Maryland Extension because you are wonderful master gardeners and we value you all. So we'll move on to the next slide. And the next, and in fact, I think actually I'm going to go and do this one, and then Ashley will be taken over in just a few minutes. Okay, so um, apples and pears are botanically referred to as pome fruits. Um, they're managed similarly. That's why we put them together in the slideshow, as opposed to how you would manage stone fruits like peach and cherries and plums. Okay, um, so I already mentioned that um, these are susceptible to a lot of different insect and disease issues, so you may need to consider using um, insecticides or fungicides in order to get uh, a better fruit harvest. Now, this choice is completely up to you. You can choose not to use them at all. Um, you can choose to try and find ones that are disease and insect resistant so that you don't have to use as many pesticides or at all. But just be um, aware that you may not get the kind of yields that you hope for uh, if you don't uh, try and do some of these integrated pest management strategies. Um, and there are many, many varieties. I mean, there's other, I, I know, over, over 300 varieties of apples out there. I'm not even sure about pears. So one of the things that's uh, very exciting about growing your own fruit is that you get to try all kinds of different varieties that you might not find in the grocery store. And so I'm, I particularly am interested in old varieties. You know, apples have been uh, cultivated for thousands of years, I think since the Roman times, who knows. Um, so there are lots of varieties out there to share, uh, excuse me, to try. And um, they have all kinds of different um, characteristics and flavor, you know, complex Flavors. Some are used for different purposes, and we'll get into that later. Um, so uh, I think we'll move on to the next slide, Ashley. Okay, and I've always mentioned um, or already mentioned there is going to be a significant investment of time in order for you to be successful with growing apples and pears. Uh, really, you need to do spend some time 
initially doing in a uh, research. Uh, that's going to be your one of your biggest inputs of time. And then you're going to have to prune, you're going to have to scalp and uh, look out for your, you know, early signs of pest or uh, disease issues. Um, you're also going to have to employ some good cultural practices in order to keep your trees healthy. And uh, so you need to consider, uh, do I have enough time to put into this in order to be successful? Next slide. All right, thank you, Sherry. So we are gonna move right along into what are the basics that you need to consider when you are going to, you know, put in apples and pears. And I guess, you know, it would be nice if we were in person uh, to have you all raise your hand or give us some sort of indication of how many of you are already growing these in your in your landscapes. I don't know if you guys have that capability or if you can can do that, but if you could just raise your hand or give us some sort of indication uh, with the reaction um, <clears throat> with the reaction buttons and let us know if you already have these in your landscape or if you want to grow them um, or kind of like, you know, give us that information. Uh, but just like most uh, vegetables, uh, fruit trees, these apples and pears are, are very similar. They're going to need full sun, so at least six to eight hours uh, of full sunlight in order to be successful and to give you the best fruit production. Um, making sure that they're in this much sunlight can also help with reducing some of the different disease issues that we see that we're going to talk about here uh, as we move along through this presentation. So this is an example. This is at my mom and dad's. So this is, for example, one spot that we decided to put in um, a Wolf River apple tree a couple years ago. And you'll see uh, some of these other photos as we go along throughout this presentation. Um, but as you can tell, we, we had a fairly flat spot. Uh, it was covered in, in grass or turf. Uh, so we were going to have to remove that. And we'll talk about the, the planning process towards the end as well. But uh, your site your site that you choose to uh, plant your trees is going to make all the difference uh, with being successful or not. And of course, as master gardeners, I'm sure you all are already uh, familiar with the United States Department of Agriculture cold hardiness zone map, uh, but I did want to make sure that we put this in there. So anytime we are planting perennials of any type, uh, you do want to make sure that you're choosing varieties and species that are cold hardy uh, in your area. And one thing that people don't always think about with uh, fruit trees and fruit, um, you know, like raspberries and things like that is that they actually have a cold requirement. So a lot of these things cannot be planted too far south. Uh, certain varieties can't because they have to have a certain amount of chilling in order for them to break dormancy. So apples and pears, um, you don't have to worry about that too much, but that's just something uh, to think about. Uh, if you do want to check your cold hardiness zone, uh, lots of different resources, but you can go to the United States Department of Agriculture, um, this website here, and we will send a copy of our, our slides after the presentation for you all to access, uh, and you can click on that and um, you can figure out exactly what zone you're in. I always tell people to, to be, you know, cautious. Uh, Sherry and I, we are out here in Western Maryland, so uh, just because you see in your plant catalog that this plant may do wonderful in Maryland, uh, just be aware that Maryland is, is versatile as far as our climate goes for sure. You know, we have cold hardiness in, that start at eight and go all the way up here to where we are to five. So just because somebody tells you it does great in Maryland doesn't automatically uh, prove that it's going to do great in your landscape. So again, apples range anywhere from three to nine on the cold hardiness zone. Uh, pears range from four to nine, so they're not quite as cold hardy. And it's just something to be mindful of with uh, your microclimates that you may have on your landscape. So a lot of times we'll have these frost pockets or colder areas, you know, don't plant at the bottom of the slope in the low spot. That tends to be where more cold air is going to accumulate and you can have uh, frosting later on in the season that you wouldn't have otherwise. And sometimes at the very top of slopes can be a little bit colder too. So um, just be mindful that when you are scouting a place to put in uh, apples and pear trees, you are making a significant investment of you know, money uh, on that plant, especially if you're gonna, gonna buy a larger plant to put in. And I, as Sherry talked about in those first couple of slides, it is a significant amount of investment of time. Uh, so you're gonna have a lot of time um, invested in this plant in order to get, to get a, a harvest off of it. 
So just a little bit more, you know your frost dates again. So whenever you are looking at these varieties and new varieties to add to your landscape, um, it's interesting to note, you know, when is your frost free date period? Uh, some descriptions on like a lot of the websites, if you are gonna purchase online, um, products that they will tell you, you know, it, it frosts or it, it blooms early in the season or it blooms later in the season. So just be aware um, that you want to make sure you're matching up the plant growth requirements in those blooming times with what climate you actually have. Uh, and just a general rule of thumb when we talk about, you know, planting any new plant, uh, especially perennials that are going to be there, hopefully, long term. Uh, we want to make sure that we do have a good soil that we're planting into. Uh, one of the most important things that we can make sure is on target and we can adjust and amend our soil for is the pH. Uh, so this is a nice chart that I'm sure every one of you has, has seen as you went through the Master Gardener basic training course. Uh, but we do want, uh, you know, a pH between six and seven uh, for most of these, for these apples and pears trees. So just making sure that you have that soil pH and that is important because as you can see from this chart in between those the six and a half and seven uh, pH then that's when the majority of our nutrients are most available our macro and our micros. So um, that's just important to, to make sure that we have our pH adjusted correctly. And if you're curious about that, you know, there's lots of resources on the Home and Garden Information Center, a website that tells you how to get your soil tested and what laboratories you can use for that. Uh, a little bit more just about soil. I know this is more about, you know, uh, apples and pears, but making sure that we have a good base to plant into uh, is going to ensure that you have a, a tree that is going to produce for you and that you're going to be a happy gardener um, at the end of, of this adventure. So well-drained soils are always going to be what these plants like. Um, you don't want to plant them into, you know, places that are wet or that have standing water. Uh, so you want to be careful with that. Um, they do prefer sandy loam to sandy clay loam, but just a medium texture. Uh, that's what they're going to do best in. So a little bit about spacing, I believe. Sherry, you're going to pick up and start talking about um, the different categories that, that apples are broken into. Yeah, so we're going to get right into that. Uh, I know it can be kind of confusing when you go to buy your apple and pear trees. You're like, what's the difference between a standard, a dwarf, and a semi-dwarf? Um, well, there's a lot that goes into this, but uh, we're just going to talk about the size difference at the moment. Uh, for, so for dwarf trees, you can expect them to be about eight to 10 feet tall. Uh, and, and spacing, you want to, if you're going to do, you know, uh, more than a few trees and you're gonna have rows of them, you want them to be about eight feet apart. Uh, because they are so short in stature, um, they tend to be not as strong as the other trees and so you're gonna to need to trellis them. A lot of orchardists use dwarf trees and they do, um, they have them trellised. You have to provide some kind of support. Um, Semi-dwarf are a little bit larger. Uh, they can be anywhere from 12 to 20 feet tall um, and you would space them about 12 feet apart in a row. And then you have your standard size trees that, you know, they could be 25 feet tall or more, and you want to space them at least 20 feet apart. Now, for those of you who don't have a lot of space, you want, might want to consider a columnar apple tree. Um, they are touted as being able to grow in a pot. Um, Ashley, I don't know if you want to share your experience with growing a, a columnar apple tree. Um, sure. Yeah, so here in the top of this photo or this slide, you can see these are three columnar apple, columnar apple, apple trees that we uh, planted at my mom and dad's house a couple years ago. So as you can see, they got a good bit larger than I expected. You know, a lot of people say that, that they can go in uh, containers and, and grow like on your balcony, but I have not pruned these just to keep them small. I've just kind of let them go into what they, you know, what they were going to do. Um, so they got a good bit larger. So just make sure that you read carefully and, um, you know, be aware of what you're purchasing. Thanks, Ashley. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, pears are a little different from apples. Um, you don't have as, as many choices as far as whether you're going to get a, a, a dwarf, semi-dwarf. Uh, most of them are standard sized and they should be uh, spaced about 20 feet apart. Um, there are a few uh, out there that are on dwarf, semi dwarfing root stocks, and we'll talk about that a little bit in a little bit. So, um, 
when you're doing your research as you know to what kind of apple tree you want uh you want to consider what the the purpose of that fruit is going to be do you want to use it in cooking canning fresh eating cider do you want it to be disease resistant so you don't have to spray as many pesticides do you want it to be able to have good uh, long storage life or are you interested in uh, the adventure of trying heirlooms so these are all things to consider all right so i have here listed some apple varieties uh according to purpose so you can see uh something I think is really important is considering getting a scab resistant apple. And you'll see all the ones that I have lifted, uh, listed here. And remember, we will be sending out this presentation so that you can look over all these and I won't go ahead and read every single one. And then we have ones that are considered great for ciders. Um, and those are all listed there. And then we have uh, a list of ones that are great for winter storage. They last a long time if you keep them cool. So those, those are some examples there of some apples in those categories. And then with your pear varieties, you, they're generally uh, divided into two groups. You have European versus Asian. Um, and then I have the European ones listed over here on the left and then the Asian types on the, on the right. Now, uh, European pears are generally not gonna be self-fruitful. Some of the Asian pears may be partially self-fruitful and we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, next slide. So when you buy an apple or pear tree, especially if you order it from an online nursery, it's gonna to come to you looking like this in the mail. Um, and so we wanted to point out the different parts of this tree to you to uh, familiarize you with it. First of all, you have the rootstock and then you have the scion, which is grafted onto the rootstock. Now the scion is gonna be for that particular variety that you wanna grow. Say you wanna grow honey crisp. So the scion actually came from a Honeycrisp tree, it's genetically identical to that, you're gonna get a Honeycrisp apple off of that. Now, the point of the rootstock is um, to give you better hardiness, whether it be cold hardiness, disease hardiness, um, it's going to affect the size of the tree. And also, um, it can also, you know, the dwarfing rootstocks can also allow you to harvest apples uh, at a, or pears at an earlier age. So um, these are the different parts, keep them in mind, and we're gonna talk about the differences in rootstocks in a little bit. So as I mentioned, generally apples and pears are not self-fruitful. There are a few that are all out there. In order to get your, the best yield possible, you wanna have at least one other pollinator present. So for the ones like the, the, the Asian pears may say that they are you know, partially self-fruitful, you may get some pears, but you're not gonna get nearly as many. You're not gonna get as nearly a good a yield if you don't have a pollinator that is of a different variety. Next slide. So some apple pollination basics, you need a pollinator within about 50 feet, uh, 20 feet is best. Um, you wanna have a different variety of the same fruit species. So if we're talking of apples, you need to have um, two different varieties of apples in order to get the pollination and they need to be compatible with one another. Same with the, the pears. So um, it's, this is where some research comes in. Um, close varietal relatives, which means they have one parent in, in common at least, um, they're not gonna be a good choice for a pollinator. And uh, your pollen, pollinizer bloom time must overlap. We're gonna talk about pollination groups in a minute. And we need to know about your ploidy. So what is that? That has to do with the number of sets of chromosomes that the apple or a pear variety has, okay? So with pears, um, it's very similar. You must plant at least two varieties to get a good pollination and, and fruit set. Now, Asian and pear, or excuse me, Asian and European pears, they have compatible pollen, but the problem is their blooms don't overlap. So you're gonna have to have, you know, two kinds of European or two kinds of Asian in order to get good uh, fruit set. So your pollination groups, they usually range uh, from one to four, one being, um, and, and it's related to time period when, when your flowers are blooming, one being the earliest time period and four being the latest. So it's not the only factor in combat compatibility, uh, you know, as far as pollinating partners, but um, 
what you want, you do need to um, get varieties that flower at around the same time as each other. And it, they could be from a different group. So you could have uh, a pollinator from group one and one from group two, but they need to have their bloom times overlap. So number ones might need to be near the end of the number one period so that they catch the pollen from number two and number two catches the pollen from number one, right? Okay, so um, yeah, we'll move on to the next slide there. And so that all seems very complicated, right? But I found this great site that gives you um, a tree pollination compatibility checker is awesome. Um, on Orange Pippin fruit trees, um, the you can see the website address up there is orangepippintrees.com. And in here, you, as you can see, you can type in the variety of tree that you have and say, find pollination partners and it'll give you a whole list. And that's really, really helpful. So I encourage you to try that out in your research. So now we're gonna focus on uh, what are the different rootstocks and we've talked about the flowering groups. So um, rootstocks can actually also affect the flowering times. A certain uh, rootstock may either uh, cause the, um, your cyan, the, the variety that you have grafted onto your rootstock to bloom a few days earlier or a few days later than it would normally. So that's, I don't know that that's such a big deal, but that's just something to consider. So um, M9 and M25 rootstocks tend to delay flowering by a few days. M M106 may um, cause flowers to uh, come a few days early. And we'll talk about what all these numbers and letters mean in a second. So uh, ploidy. So that has to do with the number of sets of chromosomes that your apple or pear has. And as you know, in humans, we, have, we are diploid. We have two sets of chromosomes. One comes from the mother and one comes from the father. Now through different um, breeding techniques, and it is not just for trees, this happens with raspberries and blueberries and other things, um, you could actually end up with triploid, three sets of chromosomes. Now, the thing to consider with um, these triploid varieties is that they tend to be um, disease resistant, very good at that, but generally the pollen is sterile. So you cannot use that as a pollinator for your other trees. And your triploid varieties are gonna need not just one pollinating partner, but two. So keep that in mind. Um, an example of this would be Liberty. Next slide. So here we're gonna start talking about what are all these numbers and letters and what does it mean? So um, these M series and MM series are the most commonly found rootstocks that your apples and pear, or excuse me, apples are gonna come on. And um, so this is what you would generally be getting from you know, a catalog or online um, uh, store such as, I don't know, Jung's or Stark Brothers or Gurney's, you know, all those places that sell um, fruit trees, apple trees to home gardeners. So um, what do these numbers and letters mean? So this is going to show you just basically um, the difference in size. So M9 would be the, the most dwarfing um, rootstock that you could get your variety of apple on. And those trees are gonna be about eight foot tall. And then you can see we go up to M26 all the way up to MM111, which is probably just slightly smaller than standard. Next tree, or yeah, next tree, next slide, please. So, um, so apples have been cultivated for at, at least 2,000 years. Um, they've been grafted onto to separate rootstocks. And why? Because uh, people who have been doing this have found that you can control the size of the tree. You can get a hardier tree, can be more disease resistant, have better anchorage in the ground, can cause earlier bearing. And so people have been experimenting with this for a long time. Um, dwarfing root stocks make picking and pruning and pest control easier. And you do get fruit at a younger tree age as opposed to a standard size tree, which would be you know, 25 feet tall or more. So um, we'll go to the next slide. And yeah, pears are a little different. Um, the standard of, you know, of uh, root stocks comes from the Bartlett variety. So most of your uh, European pear varieties are going to be grafted onto Bartlett, Bartlett root stocks. There has been some development in, in recent years um, to find a hybrid that would, uh, you know, give you some 
dwarfing characteristics in earlier fruit production. And that is a cross between an old home and Farmingdale variety. So if you're ordering a pear, you might see the um, designation OHXF, which it refers to that. So uh, varieties that are grafted onto this rootstock are gonna have some uh, desist, uh, resistance to fire blight, and they have you know, some semi-dwarfing um, characteristics as well. Now, some pears may be grafted onto quince rootstocks. They have dwarfing capability, but um, they are still susceptible to fire blight. So that's something to keep in mind. All right, so here's the deciphering the apple rootstock codes. M stands for the Malling Research Station in England. MM is for a uh, joint effort between English Re Research Stations Malling and Merton. EMLA stands for East Malling and Long Ashton Research Stations. BUD or B uh, refers to the, the Bud Agoskey series, which is developed in um, Russia. And they are especially good at being cold hardy, hardy, and they also have some resistance to fire blight. And then we have the Geneva series, which was developed by Dr. Cummings at the Cornell University. Um, these are really excellent as far as having disease resistance to fire blight, crown, and root rots. And even some of them have um, resistance to scab and woolly apple aphids. All right, so um, just as a comparison of these uh, mauling and, and bud rootstocks, um, your dwarf rootstocks are gonna be your M9 or could be the bud nine. Um, and then your semi-dwarf are gonna be the M7 and M106. Pairs are generally come on standard rootstocks. Um, and this just gives you a chart of what you'd expect for spacing and average yields. Um, one thing too, uh, pay attention to here is that generally dwarfing rootstocks, you know, dwarf rootstocks, those trees generally do not live as long and they don't produce as much fruit as say your semi-dwarf, okay, or standard. Next slide. Okay, so here is a comparison of the Geneva rootstocks compared to your standard uh, rootstocks in the M and MM series. Um, and it just shows you um, that the, the smallest rootstock or most dwarfing would be G65, and that would be comparable to the Malling uh, 27. And it just kind of gives you um, a comparison here. And so you can go to the next slide, Ashley. And, and what I would really like to direct you to is to go to this um, website in Cornell, because they are the ones that have done this research to produce the, the Geneva rootstocks. I know you can't read everything that's on here, it's awfully tiny, but um, we can send you this um, anyway after the, the class. But on this chart, it's um, it shows you the comparison between these Geneva rootstocks and the, the Malling or the uh, MM series. And it's gonna compare them as far as um, the, the first line just kind of compares the size, right, to the mauling, the ones that you're used to seeing. And then the rest of the chart talks about how each Geneva rootstock uh, compares as far, as far as the woolly apple aphid resistance, fire blight resistance, uh, resistance to crown and root rots, um, cold hardiness, et cetera. So if you're interested in investing, you know, into these Geneva rootstocks, um, I would highly recommend you, you check out this chart. Next Next slide. Okay, so back to some, uh, just to highlight some of these, the M9, um, they, they um, need a soil with high water holding capacity, good drainage. Um, these plants are gonna need to be staked because they're gonna be um, pretty, pretty, pretty small. And then um, they are very susceptible to fire blight. Uh, the fruit, you will get fruit in two or three years after planting, so that's, that's nice. M26 is uh, semi-dwarfing. Um, it tends to have a problem with being anchored in the ground. It will uh, produce fruit in the second or third year. That's good. Um, M7 rootstocks, they, uh, they have good anchorage in the ground and they will um, bear fruit in the third and fourth year. Um, and they're gonna, because they're a little bit taller, as long as you protect them when they're small from deer uh, pressure, you know, after they've gotten a bit taller so that the deer can't get to them anymore, um, you know, this might be a good option if you have a, a high uh, deer pressure as opposed to a dwarf tree, which, you know, all the fruit is going to be, you know, within eight feet and the deer might, you know, be able to get to it. Next slide. 
And then the M M111 is more towards your standard size. Um, uh, it does have some roofing cap, oh, excuse me, um, dwarfing capability. Um, the roots tolerate a, a wide range of soil conditions. Um, they bear fruit in the third and fourth year, which is not too bad. I mean, it's going to be better than a standard uh, root stock. And then I want to compare um, those with the root stocks that are very resistant to fire blight, and that would be the Geneva series 16 and 30. And then you have the bud nine ones, which are the Russian varieties. Um, bud nine is fully dwarfing. Um, it's pretty cold hardy um, and has some fire blight resistance. For pears, um, you wanna try, for fire blight resistance, try and find ones that are um, grafted onto the old home Farmingdale crosses. Next slide. So I just wanted to bring your attention to this. This is a, a University of Maryland variety that's being worked on at the, um, the, the WEMREC uh, research station in, in um, Washington County. So they're working on um, getting Antietam blush out there for everybody. It is being grown on the Geneva 11 dwarfing rootstock. Um, they haven't given a date when it's gonna be available but hopefully it'll be in a couple of years. Um, and it has been developed for the hot, wet summers of the mid-Atlantic. So be on the lookout for that. Next slide. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about disease management and resistance. The, the main diseases that you're gonna struggle with or the most common ones are gonna be scab and also fire blight. And we have, uh, yeah, thanks. The, the cedar apple rust and powdery mildew is, um, it happens a lot, but it's not quite as devastating as uh, scab, fire blight, and, and cedar apple rust. And I'll just give a brief description of this. We're not going to go into all the details of them. But the scab, um, if you look at the, the pictures on here, uh, both of these pictures on apples and pears are showing you what scab looks like. So uh, if you have a real bad scab problem, it's um, you're really not going to get very much usable fruit. So I suggest that you try and find a scab resistant variety or consider spraying. Fire blight also is um, a disease caused by a bacteria, and uh, you may have heard about that. Um, one of the characteristics of that is that you have like the ends of branches that uh, they die, they kind of look have a, a shepherd's crook appearance and they, they look black, so it, it looks like they've been caught on fire, hence the name fire blight. Um, that can really devastate your tree. Um, it eventually kills branches, and if it gets in the main stem, it will kill your tree. And then we have cedar apple rust. Um, that's an interesting one. It has um, uh, alternative hosts between cedar trees and apples. Um, you, you probably notice this, the, this disease more on like hawthorn fruit or on your, your cedars where they have these uh, little tentacles that looks like they're coming out of the, the fruit on the, the crab or the um, hawthorns. And uh, on the cedar trees, it's like this, this orange gelatinous, crazy looking mass with fingers all over the place. So this disease, um, it can cause some major damage to your, to your fruit and to your trees. So that's another one that you wanna look out for. Next slide. So now I'm gonna show you some varieties that are resistant. Um, to at least two more of these diseases, uh, and they have been recommended for home gardens. And this, my source for this is Cornell University. So we have them listed over here on the left-hand side. I'm not gonna read over all of them. Next slide. And then here's some varieties that are very resistant to cedar apple rust, uh, Jersey Mac, Liberty, Macintosh, Molly's Delicious, and Red Free. Next slide. And then your fire blight resistant varieties. Um, and these are going to be the scions, right? We're talking about scions as opposed to the rootstocks now. Um, our Liberty, Bright Gold, Priscilla, Pristine, Melrose, Sundance, Viking, Williams, Pride. Or what you can do, if there's a particular variety that you want, like I saw somebody in the chat said they had a Newton Pippin. See if you can go to a, an online source nursery and get a Newton Pippin that has been grafted on to either Geneva rootstock or the bud rootstock. Next slide. So some pair varieties with some resistance to fire blight would be Harrow's Delight, Magnus, Moonglow, and Seckle, or you can get your variety that is grafted onto an um, old, um, old home farming Dale Cross rootstock. Next slide. And is this where you take over, Ashley? 
believe so. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you, Sherry. That was a lot of information and hopefully everyone um, understands the importance now of, you know, it's really easy to get excited in the spring of the year when you get those seed catalogs or, you know, any type of plant catalog. If, you know, as gardeners, we just get so excited and I think, oh, I want to buy this and I want to buy that. And it's easy to get overwhelmed with all of these numbers and letters. And I think that it's, it takes a while to go through, but I'm really glad that, that Sherry, you went through all of that so, so thoroughly because I think it's good information. So um, the other thing that we wanted to hit on is that if you want to get, you know, absolutely perfect looking fruit like you buy at most grocery stores and, and that sort of thing, uh, there is going to be a need to probably apply some pesticides. Um, so whether you go on the organic route of pesticides or just more of a chemical uh, pesticide, we did want to list some of those that are available for use on um, your apple and pear trees. So some fungicides we have unlisted here, you know, captain is pretty broad spectrum uh, for a lot of different uses on um, pear, or I'm sorry, on apples, but not to use on pears. Uh, the other uh, note that we wanted to make was that whatever product you're going to use or purchase, just make sure that it is labeled for use on apple trees or fruit trees. Uh, either the plant itself needs to be listed on the label or the disease. And if you can get both the, the plant and the disease um, listed on the label, then um, you can be pretty reassured that that it's going to be, you know, a product that you can um, really use and have confidence in using. So again, you'll have these um, resources, these slides for you to look at um, after the session, so you don't have to worry about writing all these things down. Um, some of the insecticides, some really specific products like uh, BT are really good for caterpillars and um, controlling those types of, of critters. So again, we just recommend that you research what product you're going to use and make sure that you use it according to the label directions. And there are some really, really specific spray schedules. Uh, we used a lot of these resources in putting the presentation together. So Purdue has a wonderful um, fact sheet and, and handout that you can, you can go to. It's Managing Pests in the Home Fruit Orchard. And it, it explains very, very nicely exactly what each part of the apple tree growth stage is. And it tells you exactly when you need to apply a certain pesticide to uh, control a certain disease or insect pest. So um, again, it's really helpful. And I recommend that if you're gonna you know, take this on and actually uh, do some, some pesticide application that you uh, check out one of these specific guides. And again, it goes into the exact time, the exact pest, uh, what pesticide to use, and then any additional remarks. And they have them available again for apples and as well as, as, well as pears. Anything you want to add on that front, uh, Sherry, before we move on to planting? Um, no, I think you, you covered it. Um, I, I do like spinozab because it is um, a bacteria that actually is pretty effective on many different types of insects. And it's, um, you know, it's uh, considered organic. So I like that one a lot. Um, but, and streptomycin is an important one for protecting your trees against fire blight. So keep that in mind. And all these things that are located here, you should be able to get online or at, um, you know, your local home and gar garden center. Um, so these are all, you know, kind of home orchardist friendly. And also that um, Purdue guide, as well as talking about um, pears and apples, it also talks about a variety of other fruit trees too. So very useful. All right, thank you. So we're going to go into um, the different ways that most people are going to purchase these uh, plants. So you can basically have two options whenever you're purchasing pears and apples. You're going to get them easy, as either potted plants or bare root. Uh, that's how most people are going to purchase them. And you can get them through mail order catalogs. That's where you're going to have the most access to probably different varieties, especially if you're looking for like, you know, heirloom varieties or that sort of thing. And just some different thoughts that we had about which to use or what's better. Uh, so generally when we think about mail order, uh, you're gonna get them on particular rootstocks and they're gonna be you know, a specific diameter. Of course, the larger the tree, 
uh, the, the more expensive they're going to be. So that's something to think about. And a lot of these mail order catalogs are going to also mail them to you at a specific time. So that's appropriate for your cold hardiness zone, usually in the spring of the year. Uh, sometimes a store bought plant is going to be maybe more convenient, especially if you are just going to go plant something on a whim, which I know we say you should not always do. Um, but, you know, if, if that is what what's going on in, in your life, then, um, you know, sometimes they're more, they're easier because you can just go out and, you know, purchase whatever is available. Uh, sometimes they're going to be a lot older plant, so there may be opportunities. You may think a bigger plant is better, uh, but I've found that sometimes bigger plants can suffer more transplant shock. Uh, so sometimes that can be a negative aspect of planting them. And sometimes at certain uh, locations, so if you know you're just going to a local store that has just gotten them in for the season, uh, those plants maybe have not been as well cared for as they should have been at times. <laughs> so uh, sometimes you are buying something that could potentially have a little bit of a headache associated with it. So just be you know, mindful of that, not saying you shouldn't do that at all and those situations um, certainly do arise and, and it makes sense to do that, but just, just something to think about. So if you are gonna be planting bare root trees, you know, as this photo was that Sherry talked about earlier, you want to always be aware that you never want to cover up the rootstock, the graft, the graft union right here. You never want to put that underneath the ground whenever you're planting apple or pear trees. Okay, that's the exact opposite. Like if you're planting a rose that's been grafted, you want to cover up that graft union. So with apples and pears, never cover the rootstock or the, the graft union, I'm sorry. Because if you do that, then potentially it could kill the scion that's above it and you're just gonna get whatever uh, plant the rootstock is. So that's not necessarily gonna be what you want. Okay, it's also a good idea that when you get these bare root trees to soak them in some water. So a clean pail to make sure that they get nice and hydrated. A lot of times they're gonna be shipped in moist moss or um, you know, potting soil mix, you know, something like that. So it's a good idea to make sure that they do have a nice big drink when they arrive. And then proper installation, you do want to remove the turf and make sure that you, again, put them in a nice size hole. So you wanna make sure that the roots have an opportunity to you know, really branch out and, and get out into your native soils that you're planting it into. So you can see from these photos um, here, I'm pointing to the, the graft union. So you wanna make sure that you don't put it deeper than that when you dig your hole. Again, we see this a lot, but you don't want to plant a $10 tree in a 10 cent hole. So you can take a tree that maybe is not that large and put it in a nice hole and it'll, it'll soon catch up to a larger tree, especially if you can water it and, and prevent any stressful growing conditions for that plant. Just a few photos. Again, there's the graft union. Make sure you don't cover that up. Um, you can see this photo here in the upper left-hand corner is where uh, the tree was planted, you know, in the nursery before it, it got shipped. And then watering is also going to be really important. Again, anytime we transplant these, anything, but especially, you know, perennials, it's a good idea to keep them watered for the first, you know, year to two years, especially just to make sure that they're not going to suffer uh, any transplant shock. Okay. And then we can talk about pruning. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different ways that you can prune uh, apples and pears, depending on what your situation is. You know, Sherry talked about like trellising them and uh, doing that sort of a system. But there is lots of lots of really good guidance and, and that sort of thing on the internet, especially if you do searches for extension and extension pruning guides. Uh, there can be some really good um, options out there for you to follow. But basically, you're gonna prune them for a central leader type of system for the most part, where you have one main branch that's going to be coming up and that's gonna be your leader. And then you're gonna have a few major branches that are coming off uh, the sides. Some things to think about uh, whenever you are pruning is if you're gonna try to you know, be riding like a, a lawnmower or riding lawnmower underneath, you don't want them to be too low or else that can be a real problem with uh, keeping it trimmed you know around these trees also things uh, like if you're going to be doing deer fencing or other critter fencing you don't want to have branches that are too long or too low uh, that can make fencing a little bit more difficult so you can also you'll see these terms 
uh, whip or feathered whenever you're looking at uh, purchasing trees. So basically a whip is just what it sounds like. It's just a straight stick with no branches. These are gonna be your cheaper types of trees to purchase in mail order form. Uh, and then feathered trees are gonna be more of your potted uh, trees that you're gonna purchase. And they're gonna already have some of your main branches uh, coming off of the, the whip. They're gonna require a little less training. They're gonna be a little bit more uh, pruned uh, to kind of like give you the backbone of where your, your tree branches are gonna be coming out of. Other things to think about would be, uh, you know, protection from, from deer and, uh, you know, weed eaters and that sort of thing. There can be a lot of damage done. As you know, uh, when we talk about these, these trees, the only part that's growing is right underneath the bark. So that cambium layer, uh, the heartwood isn't necessarily, you know, growing anymore. So if you, you know, girdle that tree with a weed eater or get too close with it when you're, um, you know, using a lawnmower or something like that, you can really do some damage. Also, I've had um, rabbits that have like, you know, gnawed on it and scratched uh, the trees so that can cause damage to that cambium layer. So just be aware that whatever is happening, you know, right there underneath the, the bark layer can really affect the overall health of these trees. Some other big no-nos are that you don't want to create these mulch volcanoes. Uh, so that tree is living, you know, the tree trunk is alive. So you don't want to, um, you know, oops, sorry. You don't want to make this mulch up too high. You just want to keep it a few inches back away from the base when you are mulching, okay? Um, some fertilizer, they don't really need a ton of fertilizer, contrary to what a lot of people believe. Uh, you can give them a small dose, um, eight ounces of 10, 10, 10, around like the drip line of the tree uh, two weeks after you initially plant it. And then in the following years, they need a very small amount. So, you know, a quarter of a pound um, up to two pounds per year for dwarf, and then almost five pounds for semi-dwarf uh, and 10 pounds for standard trees. Uh, usually just fertilize once a year. Uh, you can also use compost instead of like commercial fertilizers if you're interested in doing that. But again, you, you don't want to over fertilize uh, that can kind of make them go crazy with growth, especially with uh, too much nitrogen. Uh, so less is usually more so that the plant can, again, the, the roots can go out into the native soils and scavenge for what it needs. So as far as nutrients, water, um, and that sort of thing. Uh, there was also some good information that I read about how you can paint the trunks of your trees uh, with a white latex paint. Uh, this can help prevent bark splitting. So whenever we get a lot of, you know, fluctuating temperatures, especially in the spring of the year, uh, we can see bark splitting occurring on our apple trees and also on our um, pear trees. And sometimes those bark splits can be a great entry point for a lot of different fungus or um, other diseases, as well as insect pests. So painting them white can again help reflect some of the sun's rays can which can help to prevent them from getting too warm uh, which can sometimes cause the, that bark to split and all of the sources that we use we had a great um, a really awesome lineup of different fruit growing guides and some really good resources out there on backyard fruit production so a, a really good um, list of things that you should visit websites to visit if you're interested in in doing this and with that, I think we're ready to take questions. Sherry, any last comments? Nope, that was great. Thank you, Ashley. Right. I think we're ready for questions. Thank, Thank you all you. for sticking with us. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Ashley and Sherry. Um, it was an excellent program, actually very detailed and thorough too as well. So it's gonna be a great resource for master gardeners on their website. Um, I've seen that we've had the, uh, the bounty of having two of you speaking and therefore being able to answer questions that have, have come in through the chats, which has been excellent. I think we have actually many of the questions have been answered already through your uh, chat responses. I did notice there was a question here um, and I'll just see a few more are coming in. So if others have questions, please just go ahead and submit them via chat. Um, that you, someone was surprised about the soaking for so many hours of the trees when they would been advised by DNR that keep the roots moist, but not to soak. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I, 
I've done it. I've soaked them for a few hours. It didn't have any, I didn't have any problem with some good. I mean, you don't want to leave them in water forever, but I, I think certainly overnight's okay. It's a, you know, if, if the rootstock comes to you and it's very dried out and then there's nothing wrong with putting it in some water for a few hours. Right. I think that's exactly what I was going to say. Sherry is not for days, but you know, overnight is definitely not too long. Like you said, I've done that before and never had any issues. And I guess there was a question in in relationship to the painting uh, the uh, the trunks white. Uh, does that have any longer term problems for the tree? No. Not that I'm aware of. No. No, and I've even seen guidance on that for like maple trees and you know some ornamental landscape trees that tend to have bark splitting. So the most I guess <laughs> concern that most people have is that they don't want to have a white tree trunk in their yard because it's going to be you know, maybe not that attractive. So. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Whatever happened to stamen apples? A uh, person commented mm -hmm. that they were good for apple pies. Is that familiar to you? Or? I, I'm not familiar. Um, I mean, I've heard of stamen. They're still out there. Uh, has this person had problems finding stamen or? Maybe they don't see them mentioned as much. Mm. Well, I mean, there's, you know, varieties come and go. Um, they get to be popular for a while, like honey crisp is all the rage or whatever, and then they'll come out with something else, you know. So stamen's still around, as far as I know, um, it should be. Um, and I, I think it's just a matter of what's popular at the time as to whether or not you're going to find it in catalogs. But um, I know we're not supposed to, you know, endorse particular companies. But if you're interested in these Geneva rootstocks, um, Dr. Cummins, who has, you know, was an instrumental in developing these, has his own nursery It's called Cummins Nursery, and it's in Ithaca, New York. And, and you can go online and uh, take a look at his website. It's pretty amazing. Um, all the root, different rootstocks options that you have and all the variety options that you have. Last time I looked there, they had stamen. So you might not see it at Lowe's or Walmart, but it's out there. Yeah, good. Thank you. Uh, there was a question about your uh, the apple orchards. Did they suffer much damage uh, from the periodical cicadas? Hmm. Um, yeah, well, you know what? I have um, two apple trees that are espaliered in my demonstration garden. They're dwarf, dwarf type trees, and we have um, the branches. You know, they're you know uh, uh, trained on some wire. Anyway, yes, we had. Uh, cicadas this last summer and yes they did do a lot of damage because they like to lay their eggs in um, uh, branches that are the uh, diameter what what is it actually like your pinky I mean yeah the, the, the yeah thinner branches and so uh, I lost a lot of the ends of the the branches to the cicada overpositing hmm. Here's a question about pink ladies. Are, do you see them grown in Maryland much? I don't have any experience with that to be able to answer that question, but I know they're pretty popular, so. I don't have particular information yeah. on that variety, but you're welcome to send us an email if you want us to research that. We'd be happy sure. to do that afterwards. Mm -hmm. I did notice you early on that you had commented regarding the, uh, the apple trees and the robbing squirrels. Um, <laughs> have any recommendations on how to best protect the, your trees from squirrels? Oh, no, it's just so hard. I'd have to do some research to come up with more interesting answers than what I put in the chat. I mean, if it's a dwarf tree, um, you, you potentially could, you know, create some kind of a physical barrier, whether it would be shade cloth or something else. Um, if it's shade cloth, you need to remove it when it flowers so that uh, you, your pollinators can get in there. I mean, you could have some kind of netting. Um, I would suggest, well, it's, it's so difficult. Um, a slingshot, that's what you need, a slingshot. A slingshot, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, trapping them out, getting a cat or a dog. Um, it's just, they're quite resilient little creatures. And if they got their heart set on your fruit, it's pretty difficult to keep them off of it. Um, the only other thought, and I'm not how you know, not sure how successful this would be, but you could create a feeding station a ways away from the tree so that you give them something that's more interesting than your apples to eat. 
Just a thought. That's good. I like that idea. There was a question, you know, we get we ask, we're asked as master gardeners recommendations all the time about uh, various, uh, what's easy to grow. And, uh, mm -hmm. and so would you recommend, uh, what do you recommend? Do you recommend persimmons or sour cherry or others? Mm -hmm. I think cherries are hard because we have uh, black knot disease. Mm. Certainly fighting with that. Persimmons, I, uh, we have native persimmons and I think they're pretty hardy. Um, they might be one to try. What do you think, Ashley? Yeah, I always lean more towards like small fruits. So yeah. raspberries, blackberries, they strawberries, they turn around a lot quicker. You know, most of the time you plant a raspberry and that year you're going to get fruit off of it. Um, so I, I push people more in that route. Of course, they always have pruning and trellising yep. uh, concerns. And of course, spotted wing drosophila, you know, pest problems. But um, I think small fruits a little bit easier and they don't have nearly the diseases. I, I would agree with that. Anytime you're getting into a tree fruit, I don't know if there's really easy tree fruits out there. Um, pawpaws, I think, don't have a lot of pest or disease issues. Um, you could try that if you're in the right hardiness zone. Um, and there's good varieties out there, but you need to have two different varieties. They cannot be genetically identical or you won't get pollination and fruit set. Thank you. Here's a question uh, that came in just a moment ago. If it takes two different types of trees to pollinate to get apples, how do you get an apple true to form? Wouldn't they all be a mix of various characteristics? Well, okay, so the seeds would be, right? You cannot take the seeds from your apple and plant them and expect to get the same variety that your tree is. So if I have a, an orange pippin and it gets pollinated by, I don't know, whatever other apple, it's gonna be a mix of genetic information from the orange pippin and say the red delicious or whatever it is, right? And so all of those seeds are genetically different from the parents. So you're not gonna get it to come true to form. So that's why we have scions grafted onto rootstocks. So you get you know, genetically identical fruit produced on that tree. But this is a vegetative uh, production, not sexual reproduction. And that's what um, allows you to have that integrity to the variety. Very helpful, thank you. I think that's all of the questions we have right now. I know you've answered a number of them in the chats already, um, and I'll turn it back over to Steve. Thanks, Anthony. Yes, uh, hey, thanks, uh, Ashley and uh, Sherry, for today's presentation. It was, uh, it was wonderful. Thank you for uh, taking time out of your schedule to come join and be with us today. And I um, want to wrap things up and just uh, here and just remind everyone this is a you know, to, to, to try to consider volunteering uh, here soon. Uh, uh, again, uh, Grow it, Eat It is uh, just about a week away and I uh, think you can use your help, but there's other places we've mentioned here today. So, uh, you know, consider, you know, volunteering um, um, when you can, uh, ask a master gardener. I know some other things were posted on the chat list, um, but I hope to see everyone on June 2nd in person. We're going to have our our social event there. I'm uh, working out and we'll get some more information out to you soon about that. Uh, it's going to be out there at the extension office. So some of you, this might be your first time coming to the extension office. If you're part of the COVID class, I would call them. You may not have been there. We welcome you to come. I hope you can make it. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone for their help today. Again, you know, Ashley and Sherry, but I want to thank the tech team and all the other folks who helped support today's program. Thank you very much and I hope you guys have Good day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Okay.